Hi, I'm Dr. Gordon Schmidt. I'm the co-writer of Leaders Assemble, Leadership in the MCU. You can find me on Twitter at IO Psychology or on LinkedIn under Gordon Schmidt. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talk. Hi, I'm Dr. Sai Islam, co-author of Leaders Assemble, Leadership in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You can find me on Twitter at IO Sai Islam or on LinkedIn at Sai Islam as well. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by not one, but two very talented and creative people. These are actually the second and third doctors that I've ever had on the show. The other one being Dr. Carlos San Juan from Cal's Comics and out of the Philippines. He's a comic artist there. They have co-authored an amazing book about leadership, which I think is very important in today's society, not only if you're in the entertainment field, but in your life in general. So you should be picking it up. We're joined today by the ever-talented Dr. Sai Islam and Dr. Gordon Schmidt. How are you both doing today? Doing well, doing well. Yep, doing well. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as authors and creative people that you are, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm uh, Dr. Gordon Schmidt. Uh, I'm a professor of management at the University of Louisiana Monroe. So I teach about leadership and training and human resources, but I also write on a bunch of topics, including one of these that we've been working on is using pop culture to teach the ideas of our field about leadership and those areas and that's what led us to put this book together the big picture i think <laughs> of who i am and what i do uh, i'm dr sai islam i am an associate professor of industrial organizational psychology at farmingdale state college and i'm also vice president of consulting uh, with a consulting company called talent metrics consulting both gordon and i were really passionate about our field we're really passionate about leadership this book was really an expression of that and a great way for us to kind of get the word out about you know what it takes to be a good leader and what it means to actually kind of manage a group of people. In my academic work, you know, I'm teaching students about leadership and about training. And in my consulting work, I do a little bit of executive coaching, some leadership training and some managerial development, confluence of different things coming together with this book. You know, Gordon and I are both huge nerds, if it isn't obvious <laughs> enough. And so it's really fun to kind of take what we know from the world of management research and being able to like apply it to something we're really, really passionate about. What is the most misunderstood aspect about leadership in today's society i think the the most misunderstood and, and i don't know gordon you may want to have like you may want to jump in on this as well i got opinions for sure but you go first <laughs> yeah there's no shortage of opinions on today's episode i would say the number one thing is that punishment is like a really effective way to manage if somebody makes a mistake and they make a mistake again that if you punish the individual that it's gonna correct the behavior and punishment is okay in telling people like what not to do but it's not a way to fix the behavior that we expect or change that behavior a lot of people tend to default to that very often I hear that a lot with my undergrads where they're like yeah you know just punish the person they'll figure it out i'm like well, what are they supposed to figure out. So that, that's probably the most toxic thing that I hear among students and then sometimes within organizations as well. I think that's very true. I agree with Sai on that. But I think just kind of the idea of who's a leader and what a leader does is very wrong overall. Because a lot of times we focus on these sort of famous leaders, Elon, Steve Jobs, Jack Welch, Bezos, whoever you want to say. And we act kind of like this guy did everything. And yeah, it's almost always a guy. This guy did all the work. He invented everything. The other people were just standing around. And that leader is all the math. And I think it's a really inaccurate way to look at leadership. When we talk about this in the book, leadership, influencing other people. We all do it. You don't have to be the CEO. You can just be the lowest level person on the totem pole and still have significant impact. Um, but we talk about it as if you got to be a CEO and these CEOs, they've got the secret and you just got to be exactly like Elon and you'll be a great leader in every context. And it's a really unhelpful idea because, you know, leaders in different contexts are better or worse. And every organization is made up of people that have a huge impact on it. You can't just hire one person to be the leader and then everybody else listens and everybody else just like a machine does what they say. There's a lot of other people doing very important work all the time when we act like, oh, the CEO, that's the only person that matters. Sometimes the CEO ain't doing much of anything. <laughs> and sometimes they're the ones keeping the company from being more successful, right? And I think that's really important issue that we run into talking about leaders. Because yeah, it's just Mark Zuckerberg only wears one shirt, the same shirt every day. He's got 12 copies. You do that, you're going to create Facebook. 
tomorrow. That's a bunch of crap, right? That's just not true. But we act like, oh yeah, this guy, just be like Mark and you'll be the best. That's not really true and it's not really helpful for us. Most of us are not CEOs, <laughs> billion dollar companies already. <laughs> so. I, think I do think the I do think the turtleneck helped Elizabeth Holmes. So oh that, yeah, that definitely see, helped. Yeah, and and you can see how well that turned out. She's a good leader. <laughs> That's the whole other question. Being geeks and nerds that you are, in terms of the cinematic universe and this book, why was Marvel your go-to for this specific book? And when is DC going to be involved? To us, as growing up, you know, big fans of comics, big fans of Marvel comics. You know, the Avengers and Spider-Man were kind of the first superheroes I really loved as a kid. They were just natural things that we liked. But also, I just think they're really good ways to sort of show that more complicated, more people working together aspect of leadership, right? In the Marvel Universe, you've got all these different characters that can save the day on their own. They can go out and beat Electro or whoever it is. But then some Something big enough happens that they say, crap, <laughs> we need to get a bunch of heroes together to try to save the day. And what happens, and especially in the Marvel Universe, one of the big parts that distinguished it from DC and starting in the 60s was these heroes don't necessarily agree. <laughs> they got very different perspectives on it. They're very skilled. They're very talented. They're very successful individually. And then they got to get together and figure out how the heck do we work together when we differ in so many ways, right? To me, that's really what working is about, right? We all come from our own perspective, our own interests, our own skills. And we got to figure out how do we work together? How do we convince each other? Because yeah, it's not just the CEO says, everybody do this and we do it. If your boss tells you to do something you don't want to, well, at the very least, you'll probably do a shitty job. <laughs> You won't do so bad you get fired, but you won't care that much. And you're much more likely to undermine or ignore it or not keep it going. I think the superhero teams like the Avengers, it's great to see that conflict between people to kind of see, okay, we've got to manage. We can't just tell you do that. When the teams do that in the Marvel Universe, they run into problems, right? That's kind of Captain America's Civil War full deal, right? As Tony says, we need to give the UN control. Cap says, no way in hell are we going to do that. It's my way or the highway. And then the Avengers break up. I I'll say growing up, I never thought we'd see it in a movie that was like, hey, the Avengers really screwed up. They're dead. They won't really be together fully until we get the band gets back together for the final movie in Phase 3, really. It's fantastic, the movies they've made. I never thought we would get such good movies. Yeah. But it's also great illustrations for leadership, right? <laughs> Is because these two parties, these strong leaders said, hey, my way or the highway. The answer was, no Avengers. Zemo wins, essentially, because of they didn't work together. They didn't figure out how can we collaborate, come up with some. And so all of that to me is a great way to look at leadership that's a lot messier, that's a lot more of we've got to influence each other, we got to work together, we got to get over our beefs and figure out what we need to do. And of course, the hero's journey, right, in these movies, starting with Tony Stark. He's a jerk. He's on the front cover of whatever magazine they show on that Rolling, oh, Rolling Stone. He's talking about dating supermodels and he's miserable. He doesn't like his life. He's not engaged at all. And it takes being kidnapped to see, hey, I don't really like what I'm doing. You know, I want to be a hero. I want to do something different and watching his path and growth. Because again, yeah, we don't just start as a perfect leader. They didn't just, you know, a machine 3D printer didn't just make Mark Zuckerberg. And then we have the perfect leader for every organization, right? <laughs> It was Gordon, you we, can't we prove struggled, that we developed <laughs> and got, you know got there. And the Marvel movies have so much of that. I would like to say here and now, Zuckerberg was three D printed by somebody. <laughs> well, I think that you're getting a sense of the kind of fun way that we have of yeah. looking at at Mar the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And one of the things that Gordon and I do is we talk to each other a lot about geek stuff, whether it's like old issues of DC Comics Legends miniseries from like, you know, the 1980s or whatever the latest Marvel movie is. And something that we face when we're talking with especially students is it's hard to connect with students and show them what leadership looks like. A lot of times if you do like a YouTube search about what leadership looks like or leadership movie clip, it's like one guy giving a speech. It's like Braveheart, the end of Braveheart, he's giving a speech and rallying the troops or it's like Hoosiers this guy is giving a speech mm -hmm. and leadership is a lot more than that. And the great thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is you get to see all of these little moments where leadership happens, where influence happens, whether it's, you know, Tony Stark serving as a mentor for Spider-Man 
having a heart to heart with him, you know, making a choice, making a decision around that, whether it's Captain America showing us what servant leaders look like by literally jumping on a grenade so that the rest of his team can make it. Those are good examples of leadership. You really can't find those examples easily in what we traditionally think of as leadership. We think that, you know, oh, if I just say the right words to somebody, that's leadership. But in a lot of ways, it's actions that you take, choices that you make. And the other cool thing, especially in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, especially when the heroes get together, is you can see the planning. Oh, okay, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to, you know, communicate. This is how we're going to coordinate some sort of action. And that's something that students can watch and see and can actually engage with. And it's also an excuse for Gordon and I to watch movies that we thought would never happen. Yeah. The plan don't always work in the movies, right? We've got the big plan in Guardians of the Galaxy. This is our jailbreak. And then Groot <laughs> screws it up, right? Yeah. And then we've got to see how the heck do we fix the problem right now? We had, we had a very nice looking plan and now suddenly it's all kablooey, right? To me, that's part of it too, right? These movies aren't perfect, oh, everybody does the right thing. I'm glad that you you use the very technical term of those kablooey. <laughs> that's usually what, you know, that's how leaders usually think, oh boy, things have gone kablooey. You'd ask a question about DC. Well, this, you know, our book is actually part of a series oh. of leadership books that use pop culture to explore leadership concepts. So there's a book about you know, Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings. There's a book about Star Wars. Uh, there's a book about Harry Potter. I think there might be a book coming out about Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm pretty sure there's a proposal coming down the pipe about uh, DC Comics. Uh, Gordon and I are right now working on another uh, book about Avatar, The Last Airbender. Oh, wow. We really like that series. Uh, we think it'll be really fun. And I think there might be one about Doctor Who as well oh, sweet. Uh, that's coming up. So we're just trying to cover all the geek bases in the series. And it's just a way for people to kind of take stuff that they love, stories that they love, and really learn something from those stories. Because that's a way that we all learn. We learn all sorts of things you know, from the different stories, you know, that we happen to follow. So for example, 1989's Batman, mm -hmm. I learned to electrify my cowl so that people won't be able to take it off. <laughs> Very important life lesson. Whether they're a hero or a villain, who would have the most toxic leadership of either a hero or a villain? And who would have the best leadership as a hero or a villain? I, I have well, an option for, for best. Uh, I'll, I'll have to think about first. toxic a little bit more, but I do, think that uh, out of the, all the heroes, I think Black Panther hmm. might exhibit the kind of best leadership capabilities. And I'll base that in something that I, I feel like he does better than almost any of the heroes, including Captain America, which is a little surprising because I think Captain America has a lot of very idealistic leadership traits. And a lot of the other characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe look up to Steve Rogers as this like heroic ideal, mm -hmm. you know, especially being from the greatest generation. I think that's a big part of it. I think Black Panther does something that a lot of the other heroes maybe think about doing or, or talk about doing, but he actually goes ahead and does it. And that's, he really listens to the villain. And in many ways, he is able to forgive and try to reform, tries to reform the villains in a way that, that doesn't happen. So, for example, Baron Zemo, he has the option at the end of Captain America's Civil War, he has the option to take him out. And he says, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm instead going to bring you in and hopefully going to be reformed or you're going to go through whatever procedure of justice we happen to have. We see the same thing happen again with Killmonger, where Killmonger as big a villain as, you know, T'Challa has ever faced. He destroys, you know, the sacred herb, ruins the traditions of the community. And yet he still says at the end of the movie, when, you know, Killmonger says like, you know, has been stabbed. He says, I can save you. I can save you and we can do something. We can build something together. And that type of outreach is something that I think a lot of leaders could learn from, especially when it comes to negotiation or uh, working together with somebody that you don't necessarily agree with completely. I think a lot of times when we talk about leadership or teamwork or work in general, a lot of times we imagine it as like this zero sum game. Like I need to win and the other, not only do I have to win, but the other person has to lose. And in fact, we see this a lot in superhero movies. Think about the number of times that heroes end up killing villains. Even Batman, right, ends up, you know, using all these weapons to take out villains, just partly because you don't want them coming back, I guess, in future installments, but also because it seems convenient. And I think there's an important lesson there from T'Challa that there are people, they can be reformed, 
And if you don't kill Captain Zemo at the end of Civil War, you get to have him come back in Thunderbolts <laughs> in a couple of years. T'Challa really cares about IP. <laughs> so we need those villains to live because, hey, maybe not next movie, but Iron Man 5 might have, you know, <laughs> somebody again. Um, on the toxic side, I actually think, say in Black Panther, I think Killmonger is actually a great example of kind of a toxic leader, which I think, you know, some people might be surprised by a little bit. I think because of the fact he's very charismatic, right? He's got these ideas. He thinks that Wakanda should be out there in the world more. He thinks that oppression needs to be fixed and we need to be active. And all those things, I think we can think there's merit to the idea. But what is Killmonger the leader of? What is he supposed to do? Well, he's becoming the king of Wakanda. Are his ideas helpful for the good of Wakanda? Not really, right? He burns all their er herbs. He's like, we're gonna just fight the whole world at once. If you just think about Wakanda's well-being, this is a really bad plan, right? And so we actually see a lot of leaders like this, charismatic leaders that you're like, oh yeah, that guy, he's a great speaker. He makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna follow him and do whatever he says and not think about it right? Mm -hmm. But it really is not a good idea for Wakanda and what it does. That's a pretty clear toxic leader. And in fact, what, what does he do? He has people go against each other within Wakanda, right? He kind of does sort of that tempter of, oh, you know, you'd like to be, have a more aggressive strategy. Why don't we just break tradition and do these things and all lead us to this great victory, mm -hmm. right? Um, but he doesn't have the well-being of his followers in mind. Yeah, even if we can say he's got some appealing ideas, he's a great actor, uh, interesting, you know, just an interesting character. He is not a good leader for the well-being, the long term of Wakanda. And a lot of those toxic leaders, yeah, they look cool. They seem helpful in the moment. We want to follow them, but they're not good for our well-being. You know, lo looking at the, the generation that's, that's growing up currently and who you both are, are teaching and, and guiding in the wide world, what are you seeing from this generation that maybe past generations that are currently in management positions can learn from? I think the students that we have now are much more open to concepts of diversity and inclusion in a way that I don't remember seeing that when I was a college student or grad student. I think this upcoming generation really understands the need for accommodation and space for people of different backgrounds, people of different abilities. I think that's one of the things that makes me really hopeful about the future is I think they really do understand that there are structural issues in organizations and in the world that impact the experiences that people have. And I think they're open to those conversations. And I think they're also much more open to conversations around creating space for those who have disabilities and need additional support. That's one of the things I'm always heartened by that maybe they have some wrong ideas about how to be a leader or what the best approach is, but that's not because they're not trying to treat people fairly or trying to create a, a more just world. It's really just because the way that we talk about leadership, the way that we think about leadership is not particularly helpful. It's also about online life. This generation of students, the internet is part of their day to day. They grew up with it. And to them, it's not some weird thing because you'll hear certainly on campuses, this idea of, oh, you've got to be face to face in the classroom. You can't make real connection or make real friends face to face. You need to be, you know, breathing each other's face in order to <laughs> actually become friends, right? It doesn't hold very true to students nowadays because a lot of their friends are online. A lot of their friends they may not have ever met face to face. You know, they talk to them through social media. They, you know, they might video chat so they know what they look like, but it's not necessarily that we need to be all in one physical room. And I think that's a challenge for colleges in general, of what, what exactly do we provide that's useful? Because I think a lot of the arguments that we make of why we should be face-to-face -face suggest, oh, it's because online is impoverished and isn't a real, there's not real connection. But students don't believe that. I, I don't personally believe that either. We definitely have that danger of you know, making assumptions of related to, oh, this is what's necessary. When we really need to think more about how do we help build community if a student's online? How do we help people feel integrated versus well, if we spend eight hours together in a room, obviously we'll become a community and 
get close. That's not necessarily true either. I think we just got to be intentional on this stuff a lot better to help meet these students. Because, yeah, they're not going to just be like, you know, I live three hours away, but I should come to campus. <laughs> they're not. And they can get a good experience online. I mean, come on. We, we've all played video games and everything like that. We've all, all made friends online that we've never seen whatsoever. So, I mean, this is just the next step. It's just in an educational setting. Yeah. And there's nothing to be scared of, to my mind. It's an opportunity, and we need to actually meet people where they are versus, oh, you've got to do it the old way, you know, you need physical pieces of paper, otherwise it ain't learning. Okay. <laughs> Certainly not what I believe. Give me a remote work, and I can do the exact same thing as being in the office, having a manager breathing down my neck. That's actually a big change for many managers now, right? This push for remote work. Gordon's actually got a great paper on a concept called virtual leadership that he published, I want to say, two years ago. And that's been a really big concept for a lot of companies to kind of come to terms with. The old idea was if a leader could see you doing the work, they would know that you were doing it, even if they were just staring at you in the cubicle. I guess that would be considered management. But now one of the concerns is, oh, are they putting in enough work? Are they putting in enough time? How do I know that they're doing the work that they say they're doing? One of the good things about that is I think people are more focused on the outcome rather than just saying, well, I need to watch you sit there for eight hours a day and then I know you did the work. You know, one of the advantages of remote work is that you get to see the outcomes. And in, in some cases, depending on the kind of work you're doing, you can also track the progress of it. A lot of the project management software, it tells us when things are done, when they're not done, and how quickly or how slowly people are doing the work. And I think it strips away a lot of the nonsense of perception where somebody says that, well, I was watching them and it looked like they were doing a little too much chatting and not enough working. There was too much laughter over there. Why are you, why are you all laughing? You should be working, have your head to the grindstone. I think now we're starting to see a little bit more around that. And what that does is it demands of the leader that they have to really know what the work looks like and they have to really assess those outcomes and then give better feedback. It's not just, well, I need you to be back at the desk, right? You're not going to have Lumberg showing up with his coffee mug, right? I need you to well, come I'm... in on Saturday, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a challenge too. What's the outcome you want? Because I can sit here and do nothing as far as you can see. But if I'm thinking about things or we're doing creative work, Creative work is not typing eight hours a day on a keyboard and then you get it, right? There is sort of that push-pull as well is, do we need people working eight hours a day? Do we need the outcome? Do we give people space to think about ideas or come up with creative things? Because we don't really want mindless dronery as much as we did at least, right? I think that that's, that's an issue too is like, Creative work is not about, I've got to be so stressed and spend every second typing. You got to think about stuff. Even writing the book, it wasn't like we had to have time to write, time to think. But some days writing two pages versus writing no pages, but thinking about it. Thinking about it might have been more helpful for ultimate work. And I, I think that's one thing we do we do struggle with a bit. What, what is work? What, what matters and what helps long term versus right now? Yeah, you can do two pages right now and it's garbage, or you can do less and then you're in better shape for next week or better quality as you write it. That was the other thing that was interesting is the aspect of meetings, whether they were Teams meetings or whether they were physical meetings, the amount of time allotted for certain ideas or projects or conversations sometimes can be either overwhelming or maybe just doesn't go anywhere and you just wasted an hour in terms of time. How can leadership be more organized in terms of getting points across to their fellow workers? I'll give another book recommendation from one of our colleagues who has similar training to us, a gentleman named Dr. Steve Rogelberg, who wrote a whole book about meeting called The Surprising Science of Meeting. Steve, I expect, you know, some kickbacks for every every sale that, that comes up after this episode. He hasn't sent me anything yet, and I have that book all the time, so tough luck. Steve, send us some money. Thank you. Yeah. He's written this book, and it's all science-based recommendations for meetings. And one thing that he said that I think is really helpful for leaders, and I think the great way to think about this, is that meetings are where leaders are stewards of their employees' time. So you're really managing their time. One of the things that people talk about a lot is, oh, this meeting could have been an email. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we've read in the scientific literature is that you have to make a good decision about what counts as a meeting. What is it that's going to count as a meeting? What should be an email? And when and how do you want to communicate some of this information? If you're just saying like, oh, we're going to make announcements in a meeting, that may not be the best way 
to address a lot of these things. And then if you, you know, a lot of people are tied into meeting has to be an hour. One thing I learned from his book, I tend to have meetings that are much, much shorter now mm -hmm. than they were before. I used to have like full on 60 minute meetings. Now, if I have a meeting, if it's 15 minutes, that's all it's going to be. Sometimes leaders feel like, well, I asked for 60 minutes. I need to use up all 60 minutes. And then going back to this idea that you're a steward of their time, actually, planning and thinking about the meeting is important for leaders that you don't just show up and say, well, let's just have a little chat. Good meetings don't really run that way. A good meeting is we have a planned agenda. We know what we're going to do. We know what we're going to cover. And this is exactly what we really want to focus on. And good leaders manage their employees' time effectively and recognize how to utilize that time and those skills in the most efficient manner possible. And if you liked all of that stuff, definitely check out The Surprising Science of Meetings. There's even more great information in that book that can really help you develop your leadership and meeting management skills. We're supposed to be hyping our book, Cy. Oh, Steve, man. Steve, totally want to forgot. say more, we'll work out a deal. The one thing I will say, too, is who, who's invited to the meetings and why. Mm. So we do have meetings where we invite a bunch of people of which they don't need to be there, or the information could be very easily passed on. And we do get the other side of that, which is not inviting the right people or people not having the right access. This is a story I heard with one company where there was like a two hour meeting, like twice a week, I think, with the big leaders of various areas every week. Well, what you'd have is standing outside of every one of these meetings would be a whole bunch of lower level people that really needed at least five minutes of time with one of those upper level leaders. They would stand out there waiting and waiting to say, hey, Dr. Islam, I really need to talk to you on something. Not only were we wasting four hours a week on these big meetings, there was all these people that needed to talk. They needed information that were basically wasting their time standing out side hoping can I please grab my box to tell them something and I think to me the weird two sides of it is you invite too many people to meetings that don't need to be there and then some other people aren't invited that should be there or don't get opportunities to do a quick meeting to get a 15 minute meeting with somebody is a lot easier than a 60 minute but we don't tend to actually offer that or think about it. just to bring this back to the MCU real sure. quick if you think about Civil War if Iron Man and Captain America had just the right meeting, if they could have talked out a lot of the issues that they had, rather than sniping at each other, you could have avoided the Avengers breaking up. Rather than just saying, well, I'm going to throw my shield at you right now, and I'm going to hit you with a repulsor beam, you could have really solved that problem. It would have been a very mediocre movie, but it would have been good leadership. And the meeting before people are throwing hands at each other <laughs> is, is really good basic information. Didn't see it in the Rogelberg book, though, so that's that's mine. So how not to go 13 rounds with your upper management. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I've got one of those. So for those who can't tell, my, my real name is not Sai. My full name is Sayedol. It's a little bit longer. It's like eight letters long, 16 syllables. I don't know. But it's hard for people to pronounce. And, you know, when I was a kid, a lot of teachers had a hard time pronouncing my name and a lot of children had a hard time pronouncing my name. And I saw like a lot of power in that, whether it was people kind of making fun of like how my name sounded or not being able to, to do it and having difficulty communicating with me because of that. That's a very early experience where I thought about, wow, language has serious power and it can define who you are. It can change your perspective on yourself. So very, very interesting to think about like how many different iterations of my name I went through kindergarten on. For me, I'd say an early one was getting a Nintendo Entertainment System. <laughs> <laughs> so my parents were kind of like, eh, video games, it sounds like it'd be a waste of your time. Basically talking to them about it, and then ultimately what we did was negotiating, right? And so they wouldn't spend their money by Nintendo Entertainment System directly, but I could save up my allowance. <laughs> for a while as whatever, you know, a child to then use my allowance to buy for $106.99 or whatever it was with that and any yeah. And so kind of thinking about language and being able to sort of talk through what you're doing and why something is good and negotiate. To me, that was kind of an early event where something didn't happen. It wasn't yes or no. It was like, well, what are the options? How can we come to some agreement that meets both parties? Is there anything that I haven't touched on you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview. Just remember, buy our book first, then the Rogelberg Surprising Science of Meetings. Like our book is still the, the more important one. I was going to say better. Steve, if you're listening, to, I, I, I think yours is probably more important. But 
We're the people on the podcast. <laughs> I would say that one of the most important things, and I, hopefully this is coming across in the, the discussion of the podcast, is I think our book is a lot of fun. If you want an excuse to rewatch some of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies and to get a lot more out of them the second time around and to really, you know, critically think about them. I think our book is a great way to do that. One thing I remember growing up is if you're a big nerd, you know that you argued about things that literally had no bearing on anything. Like, oh, who's stronger, Thor or Hulk? What do you think causes the Hulk to turn into Maestro or will Maestro be back or something like that? And you've had deep, hours-long conversations with your geek friends about it. And all we want you to do is to take those same sorts of conversational ideas and this critical analysis and apply it to leadership and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You're going to have a lot of fun doing it. If you ever wanted to just debate leadership capabilities between some of the Marvel characters, it's a great way to do it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Just having various teachers and trying to figure out, okay, what is something that I care about? Um, because industrial organizational psychology, the field both Cy and I have a PhD in, isn't something that's necessarily a well-known field or a well-known discipline. It was really important when I was an undergraduate, found out I could basically graduate, but didn't really know what I was gonna do. I'm not sure why that wasn't figured out. That seems like a huge mistake on my part, honestly. Talking to my research mentor there, and he's like, hey, I actually just graduated recently, you know, with a degree in this, and it felt like a really good connection for what I really was interested in. And so to me, that sort of that mentor relationship with him and others there too, really helped me to say, hey, this is something I want to do more. Uh, Quinetta Robertson as well with that being like, hey, this is an interesting area that, you know, I think I can do something that fits with what I like to do and what I think would be useful, something I'm good at. This is a really interesting question because I've been really lucky to meet a number of people that have been helpful to me in my career and in terms of being inspiration. It's kind of like Gordon, when you think about industrial organizational psychology, I didn't know it was an option at all. I learned about it in my MBA program and started to focus on that. And I was lucky enough to have my master's in IO program. I had a research mentor. She was my thesis advisor, Dr. Diane Wentworth. And she was very helpful in guiding me in a number of different ways. She listened to a lot of my cockamamie ideas about what I think, what I should do in terms of research. And she helped to refine a lot of those ideas. My PhD advisor, also Dr. Jennifer Gonder, very, very helpful, really helped me to become a better researcher, become better professor in the long run. And then a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bernie Gorman, he's a stats professor. I took a bunch of classes with him. And one of the things I took away from something that I was like inspired by with him is that he was very good at statistics. He knows now more than I've ever learned at this point, but he always listened to like the things that I had to say, the ideas that I had, even if they were like really wrongheaded or if they weren't headed in the right direction. And he really still kept this like joy of learning that I've always tried to emulate. He was always like excited about something, an idea that you had or a concept that you were, you were bringing, you know? And so those are the three folks that really have inspired me from a research and practice perspective in the world of industrial organizational psych. I hope everybody gets a chance to meet people like that because finding good mentors or folks that are able to provide you with the kind of support and guidance you need, it can really change your career. And I think that's part of the reason Gordon and I are both faculty now, because it's such a good feeling to know that you were able to guide a student or provide them with that kind of support. And I love hearing from students after they've graduated and seeing all the cool stuff that they're doing. From a professional standpoint, you are both, of course, doctors in your respective fields. You have created multiple books that you've co-authored. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? Do we want my opinion or my parents? Because there's a very different, <laughs> very different answer depending on who we're asking. Well, are your parents uh, here? But my, no, oh yeah, well, but they're, they're, they're downstairs right okay. now. But they, they would probably- hear the booze in the background? <laughs> try to edit those out. They're saying boo urns, not, oh, not boo. <laughs> so I, I would say, I think, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm successful. I think, and I, I'm not, I, I don't think it's because you know, I've, I've got a PhD or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a professor and things like that. Um, I think I'm, I, I've been successful because I've been able to do a lot of things that I had always hoped to do and that I've been able to do. And, you know, I think I'm most successful because I think I've been able to support students. You know, I think that's the greatest area of success for anybody that is faculty member. And I think as a consultant, I've been able to help 
organizations improve and change and get better over time help leaders get better as well. It's not really about making the most money or necessarily having like exactly the career that I might have wanted, but really the the impact that I've been able to bring about, whether it's with students or whether it's with organizations. So from that perspective, I do think I'm successful. Sorry, mom. I think success is really interesting because I think especially with how our world works and how people share success and whether it's Facebook posts or LinkedIn, where you just see people succeeding all the time and you end up feeling like, why am I not succeeding every second of every day? And which I think is very unhelpful. I think we end up focusing on why haven't you started a billion dollar business by 20? You know, <laughs> or like, you know, the 20 under 20 or 30 on the 30 list of these things. I think I've been successful because in part figuring out what I want to do and what I actually care about. There are definitely things that maybe, you know, my grad school professors thought I should have done that I have not. <laughs> right. There are things other people might think you should do that. But I think ultimately in life, you've got to figure out what actually matters to you echoing Psy, having impact on students. You know, I'm very proud of the book we wrote here. I'm proud of a lot of the research that I've done. And I think that, you know, I've contributed ultimately quite a bit to my field, to students, to life. I think that some people appreciate what I've done. That's one of the weird things as you kind of do more in your career is people come to me as if like I'm an expert <laughs> or something, or I'm some type of senior scholar that, you know, knows things while well, they're just a young person that needs to learn and be like you. And while to some degree it feels weird and it's kind of hard to believe at times, I think it does speak well that, you know, I've accomplished something. Some days you don't feel like you've accomplished something or your paper gets rejected or someone else seems to be doing something more exciting. And you're like, why couldn't I do that? But I think that when you actually kind of look at the long view of what you've done, I think it's helpful and I think it's sustainable as well. Because I think that's one of the big things I think with careers too is, do you want to be really successful up to 30 and then you burn out? Do you want to be really successful to 40, but then your health is horrible because you've overworked? And to me, you know, I think it's important to have a good career, but also to be able to sustain it, um, to be able to provide for your family, but also to be able to be there as much as you can as well. And so I think it's really with success, I think it's about figuring out what matters to you and can you meet that. And if your career is not meeting that, you might need to think to do something different. But I love what I'm doing now. I think it's a good fit. And so I think I'm successful. I think overall, we just have to always monitor and figure out where we are and what matters to us and what we think is going to help. Because yeah, it's not just for today or somebody else's goals. It's about what do we care about? Because yeah, you could be very successful and miserable. And that's what Tony Stark is, right? In Iron Man 1 to start with. Very successful, but it's not meaningful to him. And being Iron Man and doing all those things is meaningful. He tries to give up being Iron Man, right? Yeah. Because he doesn't think that that's a, the good moral thing to do or it's too flashy. It's not a real hero. He should be just putting his money towards rebuilding Gotham City, kind of like what, you know, Bruce should be doing, <laughs> right? But he realizes that's not who he is. That's not what makes him happy. He needs to be that hero out there, even if it is, you know, sacrificing your own life. He's got to be on the front line. And to me, that's really important, figuring out what matters to you. And I think I'm doing what matters to me. That's success, to my mind. I think that guy from Ant-Man is probably the most successful. The Michael Peña's character. Yeah. You know, he's just happy all the time. He's going with the flow and telling great stories where other people get to <laughs> lip sync his words. I mean, come on. <laughs> Very, very true. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? The thing is, I think failure is, I was going to say failure is all the time. It sounds really bad, but failure is all the time. There's things we do well at. There's things we could do better. There's things that don't work, right? In the moment, things can feel like failures, but in the long term, looking at what you've accomplished. So something I started actually the last couple of years is at the end of the year, well, actually during the year I start started, but I, I keep a document where I write all the papers I submitted that year and what happened with them. Did they get accepted? Did they get rejected? How did I revise them? Sometimes you feel like you're not really accomplishing much, but if you actually put it down, like I'm doing a lot of stuff, <laughs> as it turns out. That's why I finally look at the document. I was like, wow, this is way more than I thought. But you know, if your paper gets accepted, you're like, good, you move on. Your paper gets rejected, you say, well, I suck, but then you move on. And so it's hard sometimes to really 
look at all that, you know, just remember all that when you don't put it down and what you don't think about. You know, somebody posted recently on LinkedIn related to failure is is good because you've got to keep going and that leads to success. And a lot of that is very true. If you got a 20% chance of success at something and you do it once, you'll probably fail. If you do it 100 times, that's a lot, a lot of successes ultimately, right? To me, that is something that does guide me a little bit is, yeah, you know, right now I'm looking at whatever, two or three papers, including a proposal for a book rejected. And I'm just like, man, things suck. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow, well, the other stuff I've done. And that's in the overall thing on it. I'm sure if when I look back at this year and this period, it will be successful overall, even if some things didn't go, right? And so that's what failure is. Failure is just part of the process of doing stuff. If you can, learn from your failures to get better, to do things differently. But sometimes you get a bad beat and you just have to move on with your life. And that's just how it goes. That forward progress comes from your successes, but also from your failures, to my mind. I think that's, I think it's very accurate that forward progress comes from that. But I think one of the things that I've noticed about how we talk about failure is that success and failure are like these two poles on two ends of a spectrum and one doesn't touch the other. But in reality, prior to any success, the road to that is just littered with failure. And so I have to remind myself about that a lot. An interesting thing about the job that Gordon and I have, being a faculty member of being a professor in university, one of the requirements of the job is that you submit research manuscripts to journals. And that part of the job is full of failure. There's so much that you end up getting, so many rejections you end up dealing with. It can be tough to deal with sometimes, but as long as you think about it as, okay, this is part of the process. This is how you're going to develop and grow and learn. I think it's easier to tolerate if you think about it that way. I teach a course called statistics that students in general do not really like. Nobody comes to me and says, I really love statistics. It almost never happens. And one of the things I try to communicate to my students is, you know, stats is difficult, but you're going to fail and then you're going to get better. Let's try to make some mistakes. And then from those mistakes, we can learn and we can grow. And I think it's a healthier viewpoint rather than saying, I fail, I suck. I'm never going to get better at this. You're going to get better. Maybe you won't be the best, but you'll get better over time. And I think that people that are successful in the long run end up hopefully seeing failure in that respect. And I think it's helpful to, you know, for us as a community to view failure as just part of the process, just something that happens. And, you know, you'll get better if you learn the lessons of that failure. I'm just picturing Cy right now as the, you know, Robin Williams and Dead Poets Society be like, go fail everybody. Go out there and make mistakes. And they're like, can we learn about statistics? And you're like, no, I don't know about them either. Just go out there and make bad judgments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, let's totally make some, agree let's with what I said, but that's what I was picturing in that yeah, Robin look, Williams Dead Poet Society. Seize the I, day of making bad choices. <laughs> you, just you can't just thing. say, yeah, you can't just say make bad choices. You have to kind of, you gotta, you gotta put some boundaries on that. Otherwise, you know, my students are going to end up doing all sorts of things that I don't want them to do. And they're going to say, well, Dr. Islam told me to do it. You're going you're to see like half your class go to Vegas, get married by, to someone, you know, from there and then come back with the tattoo on their back. I don't need those parents reaching back out to me and being like, my kid got married to some random person because you told them to seize the seize the failure. Like, I don't I don't need that. The Hangover movies are very popular. So maybe you'll be popular. <laughs> The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you're already teaching the younger generation about leadership and about pop culture and everything in between, they're becoming inspired by what you are teaching them. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? To me, it's all about going out there and doing stuff, right? You know, I'd say to go out there and make mistakes is not what we're saying, but to some degree, yeah, you got to go out there, you've got to do things, things that you might not think you know how to do. Putting in the practice and learning from it is very useful. And to some degree, that is what's useful about being young too, is you don't have a lot of expenses, you don't have not as much significant health problems or other things, and you can try stuff out. You can go out there and take your shot. And it's an easy time to sort of experiment and figure out what can you do or what happened? You know, when we talk about leadership too, is it's not just you turn 50 and then suddenly they hand you the leadership hat and you're a leader even though you've never done anything like that in your life. What you've done is you've lived life, you've been a leader, 
whether they're a leader in situations or not. And so going out there, getting experiences is sort of the key part. If you want to write comic books, write some stuff. There's all kinds. You can make a web comic. You can do a fan comic. Maybe three people will read it ever, but doing it is part of the learning of that experience. And I think that that's really crucial is if you want to do something, do it. You shouldn't quit your job and be like, okay, I'm, I'm only going to live off of my web comic the day I started. And that's what sometimes we act like that's the case, right? Is we act like that's what you got to do. But a lot of people are doing stuff on the side. That's what they're learning from. They're doing things. They're starting their path on something, even while they're working or doing something else. And that's what helps them to get where they're going. You got to start the path. It doesn't mean you have to go 100% into it tomorrow. But if you start to make progress, you start to get better at what you want to do. You're making that progress down the path. And I think that that's really what we all need to inspire younger generations towards. All of us is do stuff. Go out and try. You know, even things like this book. I remember talking about Cy with his book. And I was like, we should do a proposal. And he's like, well, I haven't done a book. I haven't done a book chapter. Even. And I was like, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> I did a book before and edited a book before. But we were like, with this stuff, I'm like, might as well try. What's the worst that can happen? They say, you guys suck. I've heard it before. I'll hear it again. <laughs> might as well try. And it's led to a great thing. And I think that that's really what we want to inspire people to do is it's not you take the safe path and do nothing. You can stay to some safety, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be trying other stuff and trying to learn and seeing how it goes. And to me, that's the most important thing. We want young people to try stuff, do things and learn what works for them um, because otherwise you don't find that path that you need. You need to do stuff. So that's interesting. I, you know, I, I, uh, I remember having that conversation with Gordon about about writing the book and saying, well, oh, but, but I've never done it before. We should give it a shot. I think one of the things that the younger generation can do to inspire the next generation is to really find something that's true to themselves, that's good, that they want to put out there, and that's going to support the community. I think that that's one of the major things to, to think about. So with regards to writing this book, Gordon and I really love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We love talking about leadership. And we felt like, yeah, we can put something out there that is really valuable that other people can benefit from. And I think that the younger generation can do that. We're seeing that now. We have so many examples of young people taking action, whether it's somebody like Greta Thunberg, who uh, fighting against climate change. You know, one of the big criticisms that people have for, oh, you're too young to be doing this. Well, not really. There's nothing there to stop you. And I've seen that among my own students where they've taken the initiative. You know, I had a student once that had started their own nonprofit. No one had told them like, hey, this is what you need to be doing. You should be making a nonprofit. They just felt really strongly about it. They knew what they could give to the rest of that community and to the community at large. And they just started it. And there were some stops and starts along the way, but they were able to do it. I think that's something that you engage in those types of activities People younger than you will see that and they'll say, wow, I can draw inspiration from, you know, this person that's older than me and I can see a path that didn't exist before. I see that too, you know, in our field of industrial organizational psychology, there aren't that many South Asians in our community. There's a growing number of them. But one thing I have heard from some of them is that seeing me and others, my particular generation, also coming from a variety of diverse backgrounds, that gives them some inspiration. And so if you think that there's no way of accessing a career or a particular job, you can create that path and that can be inspiring for the younger generation as well. If your life was a movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? I kind of know what the soundtrack soundtrack would be. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite bands is a band called Fountains of Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a band from New Jersey, uh, and I've always related to a lot of their songs. So I can imagine that fitting in with a movie about my life. If I had to give my you know the movie of my life a title, you know I might say Doctor Islam's Wonder Emporium. You know, not that everything and everything that's happened is wonderful, but you know we can always highlight all the wonderful things that have happened and score that with some Fountains of Wayne songs. Think about that a little bit. There's a great indie game I love, To the Moon, which is really about people's dying wish, getting to live their dying wish in their head. It's a very melancholy game, <laughs> as you might say. But to me, the idea of, I was thinking of like, to the, to the IO moon, this idea of trying to get to this goal you have, this place where you're at. And that's kind of what I always feel with my life is about, what do I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? And how do I get there? I don't think it's always as highfalutin as the moon. <laughs> But it is kind of that thing in the sky of where you want to go and, and what's what's that goal. Soundtrack-wise, I kind of feel like soundtrack-wise would be like energetic anime openings, really. 
Um, a lot of them are to like super sad anime where it's like, well, our lives suck and everybody's slowly dying of a disease. But those openings are so bouncy. You're just bouncing up and down and you're like, well, now time for the sadness. The opening is done. <laughs> I think those, those bouncy inspiring anime songs to me would be great. I don't really want the sadness of the shows though. <laughs> Uh, the, the sadness of the show doesn't seem as good because, yeah, you know, anything good happens. You're like, well, next episode, everyone's getting cancer. No question on that. Gordon, I have to know, what is the what is the biggest contrast between, like, the bouncy opening theme for an anime and, like, depressing, like, content of the story? Well, uh, you know, there's quite a few of the series. Is the producers Key and Kyoto Animation that made a number of these series is where especially you've got very bouncy, like very bouncy songs, and then it's just like, well, we're all in school and dying of disease, <laughs> or we're all in the afterlife, and hopefully we can become an angel, but probably not, or we're all secretly dead. Mm. Um, and the other thing is too, the weird thing, of course, with not knowing Japanese is like. If you look at the words, uh, you find out that it's very bouncy, but it's like March oh, Like yeah, a Lion, yeah. I think is one of the series. Is. It's got this really great, I think Bump a Chicken is the name of the group song that's really rocky and it's about like believe in yourself kind of. But the opening itself includes basically like, essentially the line is like, you've got to do it because I've got to believe it because I don't really feel like it's true, but I have to, to be able to move on, right? You're just like, I don't believe in myself. I don't think there's meaning in life, but that's the only way you get forward. The main character like tried to commit suicide in the past. And so the opening in part is him falling into water off the bridge where it's like, I think this might be his suicide attempt video, but Pump the Chicken is just so banging. You know, it's so you're like, yeah, this is great. And you're like, oh, this is a really depressing event. Like, I don't, is this a kid's suicide that happened pre-show? Is this like in his mid depression? But man, I love listening to that song. So look it up. <laughs> it's a great song, but it is it is depressing. I think the series, you know, is kind of about trying to get over that. The events of the opening are not like half. <laughs> you lie in April is another one as well. Oh yeah, yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. It's the exact same thing. That's as soon as you said March like a March in like lion, it's like you know you yeah. lie in April. Yeah, the Kyoto like animation the and the key stuff. Like I watched a whole bunch of those series, and it's all really like oh no somebody's dying in the next episode guaranteed or they're disappearing from existence and everyone didn't even know they ever existed yeah. it's like every time it's just the pain the pain brings you back but it's very bouncy <laughs> <laughs> well i do hate to say it to uh, dr sai and of course dr gordon that that uh, that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking thank you both so much for coming on the show yeah it was a lot of fun <laughs> good discussion Thank you very much for having us. You know, this was a lot of fun and great questions. So lots of stuff we were we've never been asked before. And I learned something about Gordon. So this is a very, very good interview. Oh, that's probably good. Uh, before I let you both go, of course, where can we find you uh, online? And of course, where can we find your amazing book on leadership as well? Great. Well, the book is on Amazon. That's where it's sold most often. I mean, you can find it on other sites. It was on Barnes & Noble. I think it might be sold out. It's on Walmart as well and eBay. eBay, it's cool to see the book on eBay. That's interesting. In terms of finding me online, I'm on Twitter at IO Psychology. I'm also on LinkedIn. If you look up Gordon Schmidt, you'll find me. Or as it turns out, there's another Gordon Schmidt. But if you connect with him and say that you're looking for this book, he will then send you to me because he did that already once. Either me or my assistant, the other Gordon Schmidt, will get you to the right person. <laughs> I am on Twitter at I-O-S-Y Islam. I still enjoy Twitter. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Sai Islam on LinkedIn. I don't have an assistant Sai waiting to send you <laughs> to me. So I got to work on that. That's got to be the next. There's got to be a younger generation Sai Islam that can do that for me. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. More updated on our YouTube channel because I'm only one person. I don't have an assistant whatsoever, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And of course, the podcast is back. 